Hey, good morning and welcome to the new breed of business. Today, we're going to have a interesting exercise that uh, is sometimes referred to as scenario planning. So what is scenario planning? Scenario planning is when we take a look at um, potential things that could happen uh, that could disrupt or change the way that we uh, uh, normally operate on a day-to-day -day basis in our economic affairs and our daily lives. And they are perhaps improbable situations, but entirely possible situations. So the, re the result of this type of exercise and this type of thing, which I originally uh, came into understanding back in uh, my days of strategic planning, um, this, this approach was famously used by Royal Dutch Shell. And what they did was they had some futurists that came and gathered and created these scenarios. And they put the scenarios in front of their management team and their, uh, yeah, I believe it was their senior management team. And they basically were trying to stretch their senior management team to think differently or said another way to think outside of the box. And as a result of this, they had actually got created some scenarios that relate that ended up um, becoming very useful because about a year after they developed these scenarios and had their executives start processing how they might respond, which was very different than their normal planning cycle, that is when the Middle East um, embargo, oil embargo, took place. If you remember that, and uh, 1973 that hit. And Shell was prepared, but its competitors were not. And so this is an analogy for us in the body of Christ. This is an analogy for us to think differently as we start to take back the areas that we've uh, turned over to um, many larger companies and corporations. And we start thinking about as believers, as um, the people of God, well, how, how can we respond in the times that are coming ahead? How can we come together as the church in a new way where it's not just gathering uh, on Sunday mornings, but it's really developing communities together where our relationships are much deeper and include an economic side of it. This is part of the storehouse vision. This is part of what we've been talking about for a long time. And a lot of the scenarios we're going to walk through today, we're, we've developed a few scenarios. Um, and this is a little experimental. So we'll just have some grace as we go through this. Um, but the, the idea here is for us to start thinking differently. What if this no longer worked? What if that happened such that we can start thinking about life, um, where we're trusting God more and no matter what comes, we're prepared, we're ready, not in a negative way. Like this is doom saying, or like, well, the, the sky is falling. The end of the world is near. This is more like anything could happen. Like who, who was surprised when the pandemic hit and did everything it did to the entire world? I was. I'm sure you guys were too. Um, we didn't really have much in the way of prophetic warning, did we? Um, it was pretty scant and it was, it was very much a surprise on people. So the, the whole point of these kind of exercises um, is, is to pray seek the Lord's face. It's almost like a creative exercise where we're creatively starting to think and brainstorm about potential reactions. We have this advantage built in as believers where we, by the spirit of the living God, can be shown things and tap into a heavenly wisdom, a heavenly understanding, a heavenly knowledge. So this is not really for us an intellectual exercise. This is more of a stretching where we're at. If there are areas in our lives where we have fears or concerns or things that where we'd th where we say to ourselves, you know, I, I know want to think about that. I don't want to think about if that happened because I'm just comfortable where I'm at. Thank you very much. So that's why we're, we're going to go through this today. And part of it will be to, uh, in a way, like um, test the uh, storehouse vision and see, well, how does the storehouse vision contemplate such a scenario? How does the storehouse vision operate in such a dynamic? Uh, how, in, in what we're trying to create and being led by the spirit to build in terms of community, how could the community function in these times and seasons that, that uh, lay ahead of us? 
as we prepare for the Lord's return. Many people are talking about creating Goshens and cities of refuge, and we're even having a conversation right now uh, after this call for the Texas area. Um, so we, you know, we it's it's worthwhile to pray into this and, and experiment with it and just see where it takes us. All right. So if people have their write up, take a look down. I'm gonna we're gonna a little bit ad lib this. We're gonna a little bit uh, flow with um, uh, changing some of these possibilities, um, but we're gonna use three main scenarios for our discussion. Uh, I put them in the email as one, two, three. China invades Taiwan as the first. The second is that our U.S. banks close for a period of six months. And the third, the third one is inflation takes off again, and we see an opportunity in a crisis situation where our currency as we know it gets replaced by a new currency, and that currency is not paper-based. So those are, those are three of our scenarios. Um, we're going to start one and kind of go through this, and uh, we're just going to have to all participate together. This, uh, this is going to be less of a uh, listening, teaching. This is going to be more of a participatory, uh, what do you think? And we can just see where it goes. So with that, let's talk about scenario one. And so what I've done too is I've loosely put here some potential prophetic revelation that is not exactly the scenario, but it's something that's similar or along those lines. Um, is it realistic that China could invade Taiwan or something would happen in that region? Absolutely. We know there's a lot of sensitivity. We, we, we suspect that this alliance between Russia and China, uh, where Russia invaded the Ukraine kind of as a total surprise, um, was probably in the context of this kind of invasion. Now it may not happen, but if it happened, what, what might happen? Well, let's, let's run through what might happen. Well, we already will if China invaded Taiwan, I guess the question is, how would we respond in the West? Would we respond militarily? Or is it more likely that we would be um, how do you want to say it? Hesitant to respond militarily. So we would try some other solution, like the sanctioning solution that currently is going on in Russia, as like a a, a sort of a low a low cost, but potentially high impact uh, idea, but it may fail. So China's very different than Russia. China's much stronger militarily these days than Russia. Um, and more, I guess, more interestingly, it's, its economy is strong. Um, it's, uh, its economy is much larger. In fact, its economy rivals ours now for the largest economy in the world. This was actually prophesied by Chuck Pierce many years ago. For those of you are, who are familiar, he has a book called The War of the Future Church. And he talked about how China would grow and grow and its influence would grow and grow. And then it ultimately would challenge the United States. I can't remember right now exactly when he started getting those prophecies, but I believe it was in the 80s and he's published them. And if you look at it, it's actually much of it's come to pass, like 70, 80 percent of it. Um, but then he says by 2026, China will clearly be the dominant influence of the world. So, and he also predicts that uh, or prophesies that the United States uh, is going to uh, also be subject to China's um, influences. And it's going to have to make some critical decisions itself about where we go as the future of our country. So uh, let's start with that. I have also here that, you know, we might respond in the same way with a, with a sanctioning and that we try to use, we try to limit China and its allies with the dollar trade. But the scenario we're going to, we're going to imagine is that it backfires and we end up creating this economic type of war where uh, China, due to its other trade partners, due to its other reserves, um, tries to tighten the supply chain loops and tries to restrict and restrain some of the trade that's between us. And it turns into some kind of trade war type of dynamic. And the U.S. dollar, as a, as a result, gets weaker and weaker. 
and then it creates a situation this is this scenario in our um in our nation where a lot of things are in short supply the first thing that would be in short supply are computer chips because uh, taiwan is uh, the only manufacturer of certain computer chips and even though we've passed legislation and tried to invest in new plants being built those won't be uh, available or online for quite a while so it could restrict almost all the things that are used with um with uh, with chips and we saw that during the pandemic right we saw the restriction of cars had to be frozen in terms of they couldn't be made anymore because they didn't have enough chips uh, so you you'd think well what what's a little chip needed to make a car can we come up with another answer but in today's uh, structure and engineering, the answer is no. Phone, same way. So you can start to see how things could break down, things could end up. And in Chuck Pierce's Passover Prophecies, he talked about these trade wars. There's actually a segment we did about two years ago, and the link here is in the email, and it'll be in the write-up, so you can check that out. But let's Let's talk about that, and I'm going to open the floor up now. If anybody has any questions, uh, please please ask, like, what are we doing? How is this working? But then what I want you to imagine is, as if as those things unfold, what would be some of the ways it would impact us, and how would we, uh, the believer, respond? So, for example, if we, if this war took place and our dollar really uh, had trouble and we we couldn't get some of the essential goods and services that we have today what might be our response how might we react and perhaps before we get into solutions we could just talk about what some of these problems might be so because this is uh something where we're, we're we're giving this a shot and we're trying it i want you guys to help me out and participate don't be shy throw some things out here and let's let's give it a go so I'm going to open the floor, and I know I can call on my dad because he's my father, and he won't refuse my <laughs> question. <laughs> so, Dad, what do you what do you think about Taiwan being invaded? Do you think it'll happen, and what would be the consequence to you? Well, I think it will happen, and I think the current administration, although they talk about defending it, will not. And I think they will take over. There'll be a period of maybe six to twelve months where things will work out and all of a sudden Taiwan will just be as the Chinese claim now part of China and trade will probably continue along the same way it is right now. Well, let's for, for fun's sake and for uh, purposes of our meeting today, let's pretend that it actually causes a great disruption economically in trade. Um, so under that scenario, and I think I see Peter here was posting something about Ford, trucks um what might happen let's say you remember when cars got really expensive and used car prices were going crazy and new cars were unavailable you couldn't get anything off the lot what if it was like that but like five times as bad what 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 then what then lois go ahead you're on mute yeah you mentioned at the beginning of your talk, there are very few prophecies concerning um, this uh, COVID, but I have to I have to uh, correct you because I was reading, when because my granddaughter was reading Crime and Punishment by Dostoevsky, I read it, and at the very end of it, he, he predicts that plagues will be coming out of Central Asia in Dostoevsky's <laughs> Crime and Punishment, and I, I, I can't find it right now, but when I'm offline, when we're finished, I will... I will send a picture. He did predict that. Bodar Dostoevsky. I don't know if there are any Russians. Is Dostoevsky like, oh. like a hidden saint or something, or is he just no, a but he, writer? <laughs> no, but he did predict that, and and he wrote it. It's in the end, the very end. I'll, I'll find it. I don't want to take up any more time away from your questions. No, but no, I no, no. This is good. that. <laughs> Interesting enough. That makes sense. It does. I know. Right, coming out of yeah. Central Asia, he said interesting central asia well we know it's in the bible it didn't identify central asia but okay. pestilences and plagues are coming and will come um peter if you're there you're mentioning uh how the, the ford is still experiencing manufacturing de delays 
Um, has anyone here tried to get a truck or tried to get a car or had had similar issues? We in the kneecap, for example, were trying to um, help Sharice get a car, and there was there was issues in that even. Um, and thankfully, that all worked out. But uh, it was a struggle to try to find any kind of vehicle, especially used, that was that was uh, inexpensive. Hardly anything was available. Yeah, I, I haven't personally been looking for a car in the midst of this, but know others who have. And certainly, um, yeah, I know some people locally that they, they uh, I think it's 1976. Uh, they say uh, get, get a vehicle from 1976 or before, um, because those are the cars that mechanics could actually work on um, prior to all the computer stuff and other things that began happening. Where, where people can can still fix their own cars, uh, do their own mechanics on it without having to have all the, the digital things that are required in every car shop across uh, at least the United States at this point. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, as things you know falter and fail, whether it's one of these scenarios or another, um, you know we've we've seen that it doesn't take long for, um, supply chain issues to begin. And um, yeah, you know, uh, with the, the variety of, of um, things going on around the world, um, you know, the, I mean, when you think about the supply chain and just the, all the different ports, not only in the United States, but around the world. And again, who, who now owns the majority of those ports um, across the continents? Um, China has been been over the last couple decades, um, you know, buying those up and and getting the rights for those. Um, so you know, even in Panama and other places, um, things could be shut down at at the will of um, you know certain governments. So um, you know, again, whether or not you know at what point, um, you know, what what would trigger you know people doing that. Um, I used to think it was unthinkable, but um, sadly, we've seen enough other unthinkable things, um, you know, with Columbine, with 9-11, uh, with uh, numerous other things that, um, to me, the unthinkable isn't as unthinkable as it once was, sadly. Yeah, right. And this is the point um, we were trying to make before is like, we can... We could imagine certain things happening, but then everything returning back to normal. And it's been it's been by God's grace that to some extent that has occurred behind certain other crises like the pandemic, like the financial crisis and so forth. But it may not always be that way. And so it is it is good to talk about some of these matters like China could go to war with us like that. There are prophecies out there where that will occur. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's prophecies about World War III occurring. Uh, I know Rick Ridings, for example, is praying that that doesn't happen prematurely. Um, so there's a, there's a number of approaches. We're not trying to um, uh, know everything with absolute certainty. What we're trying to do instead is, what if? What if this happened? What if that happened? And your point is a good one, which is, you know, if you look at all of the uh, how Cuba has worked in the vehicles that they have, Amer they have stopped being able to buy American vehicles for, I think it was probably whenever the embargoes were taking place. So early 60s, late 50s, early 60s, something like that, Cuban Missile Crisis era. That um, that's the last time they got any cars. And if you look at their culture, they've actually kept fixing and repairing and working with all those old cars. And they're able to sort of in an underground way get the parts they need or salvage it off of another car. So it requires being entrepreneurial, creative. You can't just go down to the store and buy what you want. You can't go to the grocery store and have 10 different types of lettuce necessarily. So I think that's the kind of thing we're facing. And you're right in what you say. China has bought up many, many ports all around the world. If they so choose, they could decide we are going to exercise our muscles and flex our muscles and cause pressure. So 
we don't think about that as Americans, for example, because oftentimes, or even say as Brits or uh, people uh, people in France or what have you, we because the war, the order has been established for so long, we get used to it, and we think there's there's no way they could, would ever do that. There's no way they would ever try that. But the reality is, you know, they they very well could, and if they try to apply the pressure now logic tells us and probability tells us more of like what my dad's talking about which is like it's not in their interest economically to do that we're trade partners but the fact is if we push some of these things a little bit too far um has not it happened in the past historically where dictators and other strong men have thought I am going to impose my will even against the grain, even against what might be smart for our economy, even what might be best for our people. I'm going to do what I want to do because I have the power and my ego is such that I'm I'm going to do that. I mean, is that not a little bit of what we got going on with Putin in terms of his foray into this invasion of the Ukraine? Um, it's kind of backfired. It's like, you know, this whole idea that it was going to be a protection against NATO that didn't work. And now more countries are joining NATO. So anything could happen. And so the question is, are we prepared in our local communities to pivot and respond as we need to be entrepreneurial and creative? Um, and that's that's kind of the question. Like, can we do what the Cubans have done? I'm sure we could over time, but like, are we prepared to think that way are we prepared to get out of our comfort zone and get stretched well can i say something yes that yeah um it's the picture is so much bigger because we were just talking about computer chips that, that's one little thing uh, although it's a big thing in the, in the total think of our pharmaceutical industry we get something i think the last reading was over 90 percent of our pharmaceuticals come from china uh probably of, of all the widgets that are made in the world, all the little stuff that we buy at Walmart, you know, probably 80 to 90% of that comes from China. So that's why I think certainly this current administration would just acquiesce that talk big and all of a sudden China would uh, have Taiwan in its grasp and that's it. Uh, and hopefully there wouldn't be too much death involved in it. Um, and we would just literally after talking a lot, just go on with business as usual. Right. Um, but, you know, is it beyond Z thinking we're willing to sacrifice our economic growth a little bit to put it to the United States? After all, he was <laughs> managing a government who welded their own people in their apartments <laughs> so that the COVID wouldn't spread. I mean, this is diabolical and crazy. Um, now they've completely flipped their their script and like well, let's get everybody infected and we won't have too many people die so when you see uh, this kind of mindset of one man and his pride or ego and power like anything is possible i want to go to mike in maryland mike you've got your hand up uh yes i i agree with um your, your dad in a lot of senses because uh even now we have uh pharmaceuticals that um are in short supply. We sent most of our manufacturing to, to China. Yes. Uh, then there's nothing we can really do in terms of sanctions that won't hurt us, like uh, some of the sanctions that we put on Russia. I see a deception here and people, and, and also I see uh, what we have is a, a spiritual, people are not using logic now. So I'm, I'm wondering what is the enemy's planning all of this because uh, the reality is the only recourse that america has is its military power oh i was gonna say jesus but well no no well no 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 i'm talking about america the corporation not not america the spiritual court <laughs> spiritual church because that's that's where we have to to move to realizing that our only as believers as the ecclesia this is beyond um, the, the normal, uh, this is, this is a spiritual war. And that's what I see. There's a big deception because we sent all of our manufacturing there. They bought up half of our, uh, is it half or, uh, 60% of, of American soil. We can't buy anything in China and own it. 
but they own manufacturing yeah, here. I, I, I think they own the water in, uh, uh, what's that, Arizona or something like that? Water. I mean, yeah. it, it's all it, it's it's a whole lot of things that's going on that's that's demonic, and it's it has nothing to do with logic. And by and, and for me, I don't understand what that is. But the only recourse that America has, the corporation, America the corporation, to fight China is war. It's not sanctions. It's not anything else. Because China has the upper hand uh, in, in, in terms of economics, in terms of its influence worldwide and things of that nature. So I still have questions. I think this is a demonic spiritual war that we have to fight as believers, like you're saying, coming together, get past denomination, working together with people to build our own infrastructure and connections where we're separated from the corporation of America. Yeah, and so I really appreciate you saying this, Mike, because ultimately um, what's influencing the world's geopolitical realm is the spiritual battle it's the second heaven war we see this throughout the bible for example in daniel it talks about the prince of persia and we have the archangel of uh, michael uh, and gabriel who watch over israel so this is a spiritual battle now in the natural we have these things that are going on like clearly someone like hitler as a dictator creating an access uh, power uh, aligning with Japan and with um, with Italy and other nations to try to take over the world. That was demonic. I mean, that's 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 how that happened. That was no good. So the the, the thing is about the situation with Taiwan and China and so forth. In a sense, what you're saying is, is absolutely right. Like, can we really do battle economically any longer? And the answer is probably not. Do we have the will to do anything more than that initially? Probably not, but it could end up in war. So if it ends up in war and it's full on war, that has all sorts of implications of what that could look like in terms of our activity, even as believers. So it's it's important to not be fearful of what could happen, but it's almost like we may be very well put into scenarios where we're uh, the only f way forward for us as people and in communities will be to rely on the Holy Spirit so closely, so tightly for our daily bread, as it, the Lord's Prayer is, that we'll have to be responsive in ways we haven't seen in years. Just think about how the people of Ukraine feel right now, the believers in Ukraine right now. Uh, there are people in the Ukraine who are uh, being supported from around the world in different underground channels, even in the church. Um, there's there's a lot of movement to help fortify what remains of the church there to give people hope and faith. Um, but it's a whole new world. And all the things that you normally did, all your normal routines and your normal way of being, it completely gets put on its head. This is not something to be fearful of. This is something to, if there are ways we're in, in, this, in this call, we want to come up with ideas. There are ways to stretch our faith now. Uh, we were put through a situation that's totally stretched our faith as a family when we had no money to operate, and that caused us to have to seek God in new ways. But in a time of war or any of these other disruptions, it could be like that on, on a variety of levels. So any ideas that people have in terms of how do we exercise our faith today? How do we rely less on the things that we're, we're comfortable with and we're more flexible if need be. Uh, and to Mike's point of, we all these things have been given over to China over the years. Well, we were accomplices in that. And I think that's something we have to take ownership over. That's why we often talk about repentance is the key to starting all this. If you If you try to solve problems without repenting of how we got here in the first place, I mean, how do we get here in, our, in the first place? We had a capitalistic ideal that effectively said the low-cost provider without other consequences is where all manufacturing should uh, flow to. 
And of course, what that means is what Mike's talking about, which is we, we agreed to that. We gave the jobs over because it was cheaper to build. We like cheap goods. Is that something we need to repent of? Like we, we're greedy. We want to make more money as companies. So we, we get the costs lowered however we do it. And then we make bigger profits. Everyone's happy because the stock market goes up. But is that really the best thing? Is that really the wise thing? Is that really going to serve our children well in a time of the changing landscape and China maybe doing some things that are crazy? <laughs> you know, we just don't know. So, but that kind of um, that greed and approach to how we can have conducted our economic affairs, we've got to we got to repent for that, even as God's people. Peter, go ahead. Sorry about that. I'm running around. Um, yeah, and I, I just wanted to respond to everything you're talking about. Like, and I I am self admittedly overly simplistic, but the way that the Lord has been leading our heart and uh, direction, and we haven't necessarily done anything like this physically, but we see lots of little communities popping up of like just going back to basic provisions that are outside of typical U.S. economy stuff, like you know, basic simple farming stuff, basic simple daily bread type of stuff that you need to survive because we don't need a lot of the corporation stuff that we have that we've learned as normal for our lives so what do we need and having communities around that where we can have a spiritual community and provide for others in need if if time comes you know like i said we're not specifically doing anything like this we're in an rv the lord has us moving around like we're in plant city florida at the moment um but we've stopped oh. at several You've driven from New Hampshire and you're in the warmer climes. I am. Yes. We actually, we, we were going to try to stay in New Hampshire for the winter, but not in the RV. Uh, the Lord had us come down to Florida and some friends are planning a community church thing here and we're parked on their lawn at the moment. And uh, uh, yeah, so just a part of that, but we're seeing a lot of those, like those trends of communities popping up where it's, it is, based around everything that we need and there's a spiritual center of it as well and uh you know like i said overly simplistic if you want to call that commune looking whatever you want to call it but the, the center is jesus not you know self do you mind if i call you a hippie is that is that okay <laughs> that's fine yeah <laughs> no i'm just teasing. i you know it's funny I, I don't i don't identify with that at all but so you can call me all you want <laughs> um you know i think uh I think a point you're bringing up here that's 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 important to talk about um, is you know well, community. So the, the, one of the reasons we go uh, and 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 discuss about the storehouse vision quite a bit is it really starts with community, where two or three are gathered. There I am, said Jesus, and we can think of that religiously, but if we think of that economically and expand it to life. Peter's in an RV and he's in a community amongst other RV owners and people who are living in this way and style. That is opportunity to draw close together and start building relationship now where instead of ordering everything on Amazon Prime, you know, we're working together with people and we're, we're seeing, you know, hey, um, I grew this in my garden and, uh, you know, you did this and that. It's good to start exercising once more the relationships in our local community, because all that's going to do is benefit the community for one, but it counters that trend of the depersonalization of everything, of money, finance, purchase, buying and selling things. And when we start entering back in again in community and stretch ourselves to do that, it actually is a prepar preparation because don't we have a better chance of uh, doing well together if we're already in Christian community, if we're already in community, if we're already um, seeing how we can help one another, how we can exchange with one another? Um, I think that's that's critical. So community is absolutely key. Liz, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say that um, the that idea of the community and um, I my husband and I and our family were missionaries traveling overseas um, for more than 30 years. And uh, when his health began to decline, we 
uh, came back and resettled again in the Dallas Fort Worth area. But <clears throat> over the last few years, um, just speaking in terms of, of my relationships, which have been global, global colleagues and working through email and um, Zoom and those kinds of things. But we've been really sensing the Lord speaking to us about building the face-to-face -face relationships in our local communities. And um, so I think um, the idea of um, the community and thinking in terms of uh, places of refuge and becoming even people, families of refuge, that we um, become producers again, uh, that God created us as creative beings in his image and exercising that and asking him, you know, what, how is he wanting us to position ourselves um, uh, and, and looking at what uh, God usually starts with what's in our hand. So asking him, okay, show me, help me see, like with Moses, when he was sending him back to Egypt, you know, he, he started with Moses staff that became the rod of the Lord. And like the little boy with his lunch of uh, to feed all this massive group of people, all there was, was, you know, in that area was a little boy's lunch, five loaves, two fish. But when it was given to Jesus, he blessed it and broke it and it became more than enough. So I think we are moving into a season when we are going to be able as believers and followers of Jesus, as we move as the Lord's calling us to, we're going to see more and more God multiplying what we have and giving us creative uh, solutions for things. Um, this last year, my family and I uh, had to relocate for half the year because one of my son's wives was critically ill and we, uh, our family, so it's me, my youngest daughter, her husband and two children moved down close to the area and we're living in uh, little temporary rentals to be able to be close enough to help uh, the family with their three children. And then while our house was vacant, our house was used by two different families that were needing housing for that period of time. So I think we're gonna see that kind of um, learning how to help each other in practical ways, like what you're talking about, Greg, You know, what do we have? What can we do? What skills do we have? Um, one of the things that has kind of surprised me as I've, I tend to think like this in terms of, if you think of the old sailing ships, there was the guy up in the crow's nest, I tend to be the one that likes to be in the crow's nest, kind of trying to peer ahead and listen to the Lord and say, okay, Lord, what's Watch. coming? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So um, I was surprised to realize, I think probably most likely what we will see coming is not an all out um, uh, war in the way we think of war. In fact, I think we already are in World War III it just looks very different than what other wars have looked like. I think they call it, is they call it asymmetrical warfare where they're working through uh, uh, undermining your economy and doing, doing things like, for example, the tensions between Iran and Israel, for example, and the development of nuclear weapons. Uh, it has been purported that Israel was tinkering with tampering through uh, computer programming with the uh, centrifuges and with the production of the nuclear materials and so on by putting in uh, uh, cyber warfare. Uh, yeah, cyber warfare. So I think like, for example, there's question about the FAA flight stoppages uh, actually that happened in more than our country. It was our country, Canada, the Philippines, and I think a couple of others that had a similar problem. And there's some suspicion that actually there were, there was a ransomware type thing where uh, they were being uh, basically uh, threatened and, and were having to pay ransoms or something of the order uh, on a large scale that just was not made public. Uh, the farmland being purchased, for example, by China and other people that would have global governance ambitions 
um, and the destruction of a lot of the food processing facilities in the United States. Um, there's a lot, a lot of indications, I think, already that there are uh, other people in control of key systems, uh, the electrical grid and other issues that um, our infrastructure in general is aging, highways and so on, that have not been maintained very well. So we've been coming along in this. And I think, like you said, Greg, we're, we're complicit in it. We've been uh, happy, fat and happy and want to just carry on with our lives and not be bothered to uh, take responsibility for things. And I think it's been a huge wake up call to the church. And I think there are some that are waked up and are working now to realize how, how far the corruption is spread and how much work there is to be done. But I think there's probably still a lot more that we don't realize. And I think another piece that I'd like to say is as much as the economy and economic things and provision is an issue, I think we're being forced to look at kingdom living from a holistic perspective in terms of our health and our relationships and um, our, the purpose of our lives, a comprehensive uh, look at what does it mean to live in the kingdom? Because I think we've drifted so far that we really scarcely know what it means to live as the first century believers did. And I think they were being called out from the world system and they were discovering it as they went you know, at great cost. But I think there are churches like the church in Iran that are discovering that and walking in it, the church in Afghanistan and these highly persecuted areas, even in China. Uh, I just got a report from a friend that has worked with the underground church in China and was telling me that as far as he knows, there are no expat workers any longer inside China. And the, all of those that are still believers have been driven deep underground because of the extreme amount of surveillance that's possible, the social credit scores and the um, all of the facial recognition, voice recognition and everything that it's so easy for the government to keep tabs on people. It's very difficult for them to move about so they don't have cell phones at all. Um, and a lot of the things that we would take for granted, they don't use because of the ability to be tracked. So it would, it would radically change our lives. Looping back to your scenario about China and Taiwan, I think that given what we saw over the last three years, I think things would happen a bit more slowly. I think it won't be abrupt, uh, like one day to the next, but I think it will be rapid where um, if one of the many things pending like North Korea or China, Taiwan, or the Russia, Ukraine thing escalates into Europe or the Iran, Israel thing were to uh, break out and there's others um, that it would show up weaknesses in all the systems uh, in a fairly short amount of time, but yet there would still be a little bit of time. It wouldn't be quite overnight, uh, but I think it's to the advantage of those that are wanting a one world government not to provoke a world war if they can do it by legislating it into being. And this week uh, in Davos, Switzerland, you know, the World Economic Forum is meeting. It's quite appalling, the proposals and the things that they're putting forward and the technology for what they're wanting to do actually is already there. So um, I think we're much further along in a lot of ways than most of the church realizes in terms of moving towards one world government and in terms of things we see spoken about in Revelation. But yet, I think, like Rick Ridings was saying, um, God is, is beseeching us as a church to pray and intercede for the time not to be accelerated and not to move ahead of his time. Of course, certainly he's in control of that, but I think he invites us as his partners to join him in praying and interceding to that end. So I think part of the preparation is the prayer and part of it is to really be seeking him. How do I come out of Babylon fully in all the areas of my life? How do I um, learn to depend on you for everything? Um, and what does that look like? What does it mean really to live fully in the kingdom, all of life under the Lordship of Jesus, all my relationships, my vocation, everything. And 
I think that's the that's the big challenge is he's inviting us to ask him and let him teach us. And so we we need to really be that childlike um, seeker of God, you know, that's willing to be taught, willing to adjust. Absolutely. And I think we're in a culture in the West, uh, which is working against us in many ways of being very individualistic and selfish, uh, say in the US, that we want what we want. We'd like to have everything under our domain. We, we want to be our own um, rulers, I guess, if you want to say it that way, you know, develop our own gods, develop our own ways of being that's very ingrained in our culture nowadays. And I think like what you're pointing out, which is if we don't come together in prayer and we don't come together in unity and we just try to live in the past, um, it's, it's not going to be, it's not going to be, it's not going to go well, I think for us um, being in that old way of thinking and being. So I see a great opportunity and I'm sure you'd agree uh, that in the prayer movement and in the unity movement, which has much lower overhead um, in terms of institutional religion and church and so forth, um, it actually leverages a lot of uh, existing infrastructure and what be it homes, be it um, places you to meet or gather. Um, and I think that kind of approach is really going to serve the church well in the future. So I'm looking toward, Lord, how are you taking these prayer movements and these unity movements and growing them into a broader movement? Because one of the one of the issues we face is churches are also very individualistic. Ministries are also very individualistic. They have their own infrastructure, their own administration, their own fundraising, their own center of gravity, their own marketing team to share. Look at what we're doing. Look at what we're doing. And I think a lot of that is a luxury that won't be affordable in the days ahead to sort of put ourselves in ivory towers and say, well, we'll live more like everyone else does, have our independence, but we'll still do the, the work of the kingdom. I think that this, this movement is moving much more towards, hey, we have to share things. Like you're talking about sharing homes and, and housing and providing a flexibility we can't just pay everybody all the income in the world with the benefits and just raise funds. That's uh, that seems to be a model that's not survivable in some of these scenarios. So we have to start thinking about as the church, what does that look like? How do we change? How do we need to be flexible, adoptable? You know, can we can we be the church without all of the overhead, without all of the infrastructure, without all of the the things that are required today, including technology and everything else, what can we learn from our brothers and sisters in China who are going deeply underground when we can't use technology because it leads to persecution and, and stopping the gospel being sent forth, how else might we operate? And how can we start doing that in community today? What are low cost ways of coming together that bring a great benefit relationally and then let's pursue those matters and go deeper there. Mike, uh, go ahead. Yeah, very, very quickly. I, I just wanted to say, that's one of the things that we, we, that I'm doing with a small group of people here is, uh, again, I, I mentioned last week uh, uh, when the season changed, the farmers, the Amish farmers, they have markets locally. And in our urban area, you, you, we have little spaces where we do have urban gardens and things of that nature. And we're trying to do more of that to teach people how to live sustainable. And so um, <laughs> it's really, really, really interesting. Those are the type of things that, that, that we're trying to do. Take some of these spaces that can be turned into urban gardens and actually teaching the children at a young age how to grow things, their own food and things of that nature. Uh, so again, it's the small thing because I'm not going to need a bar of gold and, 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 and you know when there's a famine. <laughs> and right. so it's it's what can the urban communities uh, provide for uh, maybe the rural farmers that we can work together to bring food from directly to the farm, from, uh, cut out the middleman. What do they need that we have 
that we can provide them? What skills do we have? And so what we're doing is trying to build skills for people where they have, you know, hands-on skills where I can make something, I can build right. something and, and things of that nature. So we have to get back to that concept of saying that what if money doesn't mean anything anymore? How right. do I live? And thank you for bringing that up because that's scenario two. What if the banks close for six months and nobody can get access to any of their money? You wake up and you go to the ATM and says, sorry, come back later. We're having technical difficulties. What do we do? What, you go to the gas station, you put your credit card in and the pump says, um, you know, authorization is not possible and so forth. So we, 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 that's part of, that's one of these other scenarios. Like if you don't have the financial access that we normally do, how do you respond? What can you do? Um, who do you know that could get you gasoline where it's not all tied into a computer system and it only releases the gas pumps if you have your authorization provided? Um, it reminds me of uh, some of the things that we went through at different times where we absolutely had no money and God used that as a way of forcing me to pray and ask for what to do and he revealed, do it through relationships. And so the relationships were with the people I had already been working with. But with them, it was always, oh, here, I give you my card. Or here, here, I, I have this all paid for ahead of time. What that then caused us to do is to talk to people and say, hey, look, I don't have any money. But would you work with me? My family needs food. My family needs gas. Um, this is a situation that will change in the future will will can we work together uh we've given you we've worked together with you in the past like will you work together and that has birthed the opportunity to work without money and i think that's something our culture does not do really much anymore especially in the urban areas and so forth so starting off small is good like just taking a step of a community developing an urban garden it could be small it may not feed everybody all at once right away, but that's okay because if we're just planting plants together, there's something wonderful in that, isn't there? Instead of just going down to Whole Foods and expecting all the plants to be there under bright lights. Um, I wanted to see if Doug could chime in on this. We're talking about food. We're talking about uh, food supply and agriculture. That's one of his focuses especially with the statesman's project and i'd like to hear from doug with some of these scenarios doug um and some of the work you've been focused on what are your thoughts how can people here prepare and um what are you seeing that's working <laughs> well thanks as always it's been a very uh engaging discussion around the status of the world and and um, it's, <laughs> yeah, there's a lot going on in that area, Greg, as you know, we had a conversation here not that long ago, and um, it's kind of hard to, to tie it up uh, in just a few minutes, but I'll try. Um, I'm, <laughs> Whatever you think is, a, is, is something that people could benefit from hearing would be great. Right. And that's, um, I've actually sat down and, and begun finally really putting some work into my third book, <laughs> which uh, right now has the working title, Cultivate and Keep. And the premise behind it is this, and I'll, I'll kind of put it out there because what's driving writing the book is just having this discussion with various people and then having it resonate in the spirit with them, the feedback I get, and that's this. Um, if we look at scripture and everything, you know, my tendency is to go back to Genesis and, and like pull out God's original intent. What was his purpose for doing A, B, and C in the beginning, right? <laughs> and then the fall happens and we're dealing with the consequences of that. But in the beginning, what did he, what, what was his, his intent? And, and as I began to get back into Genesis again, I realized and, and began to read that Okay, the very first commission he gave humanity was through Adam. It was before he even created Eve. And it's in Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, where he told him to cultivate and keep the garden. And those two words in the Hebrew have the connotation of serve and protect it. We needed to, as humanity, understand in the beginning that to serve and to protect creation was the way that it would produce the abundance necessary 
for humanity to, to derive the energy from it, the economic energy, food, sustenance, it begins with that, in order to build his kingdom, in order to, you know, fulfill the mandate that back in Genesis 1.28 to take dominion and subdue the earth. We had to cultivate it and keep it. And we haven't done a good job of that at all. And, uh, you know, the, the, the resources, the way that we're uh, commercializing and transactionalizing and, and industrializing food processing, distribution, all that kind of thing is not really in alignment, I don't think, with God's original intent and ways. Um, it's got efficiencies, but what it's done with anything that becomes hyper efficient, it breaks down relationship. And food was always meant to be something that was a very intimate connection. The consumption, the, the creation, consumption, distribution of food, the sharing and breaking of bread with one another. You see that throughout scripture. Jesus's last act with all of his disciples was to do what? To break bread with them, to have communion, to share and, and actually tie himself into the act of eating and drinking into an intimate relationship with him. So there's there's a there's a story that weaves through scripture about how vital and important that is that I'm working on kind of bringing out in this third book and it's it's a smaller book but it's going to be very pointed. Now all that to say on the area of food distribution and food security it's really the church getting back to understanding that. This is something that we're supposed to be involved in. We're supposed to be involved in stewarding the earth. We're supposed to be involved in the creation, the distribution, the consumption of food in a way that builds relationship, that it becomes an intimate part of our interaction with one another. And so one of the things that I've I've talked with people about is okay, let's let's talk. We're seeing this this resurgence in regenerative agriculture that's coming. And it's really, I mean, God's behind it. And that regenerative agriculture is really getting back into his practices and stewardship of the earth and very significant ways that that puts hands to it and kind of you know gets away from the commercial industrialization of it okay so how do we bring that into a local expression how do we get local christian farmers to come together to cooperate to provide for the community this thing called food and provide that food security at a local level and then the church enters in to become committed consumers cons com customers if you will of what's being produced and the abundance that comes out of that then can be used for all kinds of great community things, building equity and, and others, you know, their physical, mental, mental, uh, spiritual well-being. It becomes a foundational source of that because without food, we die. <laughs> we can do nothing. The, the great commission cannot be fulfilled without the first commission being stewarded well. So I'll stop there. That's a bit of a download that's come in the last, you know, few weeks, but it very much has to do with local communities, local food security, and a um, and a mechanism to actually bring this forward and have the church become intimately involved with it. Yeah, thanks for sharing that with us. There's a lot to it. Um, you know, there's two pieces of uh, facts on the ground. Like when the pandemic hit, there was the meat packing trouble where remember the workers were affected with COVID, and we quickly realized, wait a second, all the meat goes through this one packing company. How could that be possible? Or a substantial portion of it. But it's true. It actually reveals these weaknesses where we've agreed for the sake of efficiency and money and profitability to strip out like a lot of those interactions between people and just leave it to a machine, a black box that produces a sausage or whatever is the food that comes out the other end but we miss that whole opportunity as believers to participate in that process and kind of gotten uh, fooled or lulled to sleep in this way a lot of the uh, the plain states like out where you are doug they're as you just described in the phone call the other day monoculture in terms of what they grow just just corn just soybean just this or that and that then in turn relies on the commodities markets and all of these other global factors that can be disrupted about whether or not that produces the money so that people can buy what they need so even the farmers need to go to the grocery store and get uh, tomatoes from mexico because they're not growing them or what you know whatever the right example is which is kind of crazy but 
that's the reality of our situation today. We're we're very much levered on a utopian <laughs> ideal of global commerce and economy uh, in, for the sake of profitability. And it has many weaknesses structurally and strategically. So this is, a, this is opportunity uh, for the church. Yeah, it, it's a major opportunity for the church to reclaim something very fundamental. And the great thing is, um, you know, I had a conversation with a pastor here in Kansas City that uh, a pretty good sized church is one we attend. And I'd never really spoken with him before, but God kind of pressed on some of the things they're doing and said, you need to go talk to him. So I got a meeting with him and I didn't know where it was going to go. Spent an hour with him, though, but by the end of the hour, he said, Doug, we're on board. Let's see what we can do with this. And one of the reasons is the gospel is embedded in the consumption of food. <laughs> I mean, when you're when you're sharing that with somebody, maybe somebody who's poor, you're sharing a meal with them, uh, you know, friends, family, whatever, you can, it's like something had to die for you to live physically. Well, guess what? <laughs> Someone had to die for you to live spiritually. And so the gospel message can be wrapped into this whole ecosystem and this whole relational aspect of coming together with food. And when we're, you know, when we have hospitality, we always gather around in the kitchen and, and, and you know, the conversation always ends up, you know, around the kitchen table and food. And that's just the way we were created to be. But we've lost that. We've lost touch with that to such a degree. And all we're saying is, man, we can bring that back now. There's huge opportunity to begin to reclaim that. And, and it can have some massive implications for the kingdom and, and the gospel. Right. And in case people get overwhelmed with, well, how on earth would we replace all of that food? You don't need to get overwhelmed with that. I think my friend David Brown out of San Antonio said this. Yeah, God is for parallel economies where we are um, we're not going to be subject to the buying and selling mark of the beast if we enter into the economy of giving and receiving. So this is a thing I wrote down when you were speaking is the currency of the kingdom is relationships. Peter Rondu was talking about uh, God saying, hey, the what's the, I forget how you put it, Peter, in your chat post there, but invest in the currencies that matter. Well, the ones that matter the most are relationships. And I think we've devalued that in our current culture, but it's like completely the, the whole value of God is like people and people being saved and people having eternal life with God together with them in a family, you know, sons and daughters together. And it's family that comes around that dinner table and family, you know, also can cultivate the, the earth. Um, the things that will last in times of all sorts of shakings are going to be land and people. Um, and if we have those, then we have the basic elements of working together with God. So starting off a little is good. Like there's nothing, there's no downside to that really. Even if it's sort of like you might think, well, this won't solve the world's problems by having a community vegetable garden. It can be very redemptive and productive in and of itself. And then what it does is it provides a roadmap and a runway. And we already know some folks that we're working together with that when thing when needs get greater, we already have a starting point. Uh, Natasha, you've had your hand up, so like to hear from you. Great to see you. Thanks, Doug. Hey, yes, thanks, Greg. Um, so for me, I really just have something that um, is pressing on my heart. God's been speaking to me over this process. You know, first off, that we're all most likely pioneers that we've received prophetic revelation about this insight um, and joining this journey and that it's a process. Um, but, you know, the one of the major hindrances, I believe, for people will be their soul, right? Because their soul's been lured, it's been manipulated, it's been um, marketed to through so many different avenues. Um, and people aren't aware that, oh, I'm actually not in control of my soul. You know, I'm actually making choices based on what I see, what I know, what I believe. And I'm not making choices because of what I actually want to do. And so for me, God's like, people need to understand that they're created um, as a three-part being. 
your spirit saved, right? But your soul and your body have to work out its salvation. It has to get the understanding, the wisdom. God can supernaturally do it. You know, like some people have that instant revelation and they turn a corner and they repent instantly. Um, some people might need that breaking off. Like, okay, I'm really addicted to television or I'm really addicted to coffee. Um, what if Starbucks shut down again? You know, like how many even Christians would be truly tormented on a daily basis because they cannot have that sugar and that great combination that the marketers did to combine those coffee drinks. I mean, it's Jonesy miraculous. Coffee. Oh my gosh. Um, so, you know, for me, it's, and I'm trying to make it an ebook where I can give it out for free easier, but giving that understanding that, Hey, you have to stay aware that all things are marketed to you because they know how your body works and how your soul works. They know what receptors need to be fed. Um, and so for me, in a practical sense, we need to start being aware of these things, start having conversations about them, because even to have a healthy, good relationship, we have to know what is my, what are my needs? What are my wants? You know, I don't want to just go and manipulate you to do something in a relationship, not meaning to, but because I don't know and understand myself well enough. Um, and so I think that's a really big key that we have to, even people on this call, like God can give you a solution. Like, how are you going to unveil the manipulation that's happening? How are you going to build up the actual family of the body of Christ to show the world that we're not actually selfish people or we shouldn't be right. I mean, we might be, but we shouldn't be, we should be people that are laying down our lives. Like we're saying and opening up our homes to say, Hey neighbor, I don't care if you're another religion, do you need food? Come and sit at my table and let's have a conversation. And, um, yeah, I think that's really hard for Christians. I think it's really hard because they don't understand even their own souls. Like how much are we being, being manipulated on a daily basis? Um, and marketing to me can be a major part of that is, um, you know, to market something, you have to get past of their conscious state. <laughs> so, I mean, to me, that could be a little bit of like, oh, I'm marketing you. I got to get past of who you think you are. And I got to tell you who you are. And so, but if we know who we are, and we know our identity and we know what we want to do, then we can then make these choices and decisions easier with what you're even presenting, Greg, and what this group is like, okay, we can jump on board easier because I no longer need or I'm not being manipulated by these other things. And so that's my prayer. And that's something that I'm trying to bring solutions to is how to get people empowered as an individual um, and really make great decisions. Amen. Yeah, that's really great. So we need to understand uh, the areas where we've been sort of manipulated and deceived, and we may not acknowledge that on a daily basis. Um, I, I, uh, I also remember too, like when, when we were going through some of our leanest times and God was asking me to donate to a food bank here locally in our town of Wilton, I was thinking, okay, I should donate like the, the, the nutrients and the, and the common things that people need. And the Lord was directing me like, why don't you donate coffee? Because you like coffee and people who don't have things, they like coffee too. So it's just sort of a, a point where we, we realize like, whoa, that's, that's interesting. Like we don't survive on that, but we sure do uh, enjoy and appreciate it. Uh, Kay, go ahead. Yes. Yes. About a month ago, I was in prayer and the Lord was showing me the loaves and the fishes and uh, that he was teaching. And what he was saying to me is, regardless of what's going on in the world and we know supplies chains various things might be eliminated and he said but i will i still own the world i own the seas i own the land what needs to happen though is a unifying of his people under his teachings the loaves and the fishes that he will provide land he will provide fish from the sea but it's under the headship. And if you put seven and five together, 12, 
under his kingship, his headship, his direction, and he will multiply the loaves and the fishes like he did when he walked the earth the first time, and that he is preparing his people to understand this. Some people might see one thing, some people might see another, but ultimately it's coming together in unity and realizing no matter how dark the days get, no matter how hard things seem to be, he's still the God of creation. He's the God of the land and the sea. And in his kingdom teachings, and it's interesting because he was teaching the masses at that point. But if we follow and learn even more about what kingdom mentality is and how we walk it out, there will not only be provision, but he will multiply it. Don't mean that it's going to be easy, but that the kingdom principle of the loaves and the fishes will be multiplication yes. because he is God and he owns the land and the sea. Amen. So that's, that's case reminding us that we have a special, we are a special people. We believing in God have access to the heavenly resources and to the heavenly way forward. And that includes miracles that we maybe don't seek or see today because we're already in the routine of having everything supplied. But this is a very true and present reality that God is with us and amongst us. And we could draw down these heavenly resources as the people of God. So even as we bring together some of these good things to do naturally, there's also this extra engine that God provides a provision, which is just miraculous provision that can come, God could create something from nothing. And we can too, because we're formed in his image. If we operate together with the Holy Spirit. Um, thank you, Kay, for bringing that up. And we, you know, if anyone here has a testimony that they want to share of miraculous provision, we've done that before on different calls and conversations, but by all means, please uh, please share with us some of those things. Um, Mayo, if I'm pronouncing your name right, thanks for sharing hey, on video. Hey, how's it going? Good to see you. <laughs> Thank you. How are you? Thank you, yeah. Welcome. I, I, I'm good. Thank you. Making breakfast for my wife and toddler, so I wasn't able to be responsive earlier. But um, such is family life, right? You're from Cincinnati. But, um, yeah, I wanted to. Cincinnati, that's right. I'm from Ireland originally. But yeah, I wanted to respond to some of the things. Great phone call, by the way. Very interesting. Um, very interesting talk. Hey, we lost you there. Topics, great people on board. Um, great insight. Well, we don't know the truth about what's going on. You know, we hear a lot of talk about Russia, Ukraine, China. We don't know the truth. And we always have to pray. Can you hear me? Is that better? Yeah, you're you're coming in and out, but if you yeah, go ahead. If you uh, maybe take yourself off video while you story speak, story my life, yeah, story my life. Maybe that the audio um, will be clear. Yeah, with, with, is that better? Yeah, go for it. Try now. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, so we don't know the we don't know what's the truth of what's happening right now in Russia, Ukraine, China, the U.S. We just don't know, and. We have to, um, I believe, pray the Father's will with all these things, that his will be done. Um, we could pray for Russia or against Russia. We have Christians who are Russian, Christians who are Ukrainians. We don't know what's going on. Yes. So let's always remember that, uh, you know, we, we, th we think we know what truth is, but the first victim of war is truth. And the only truth that we know is the truth of the gospel. And we can hold and cling to that, but we can't cling to what man says about the world today. And... Um, you know, as it says in scripture, there'll be uh, rumors of wars and wars, but no one will know when the Son of Man returns. We don't know what's going to happen next. And so a lot of this is conjecture. But what I suspect will happen is we'll see the best and we'll see the worst at the same time, because we know this with much is true. When the world is bleak, when the world, it seems like all, everything is lost, the, the light of the Christian shines brightest. So our light and our time as a church is coming to its strongest point at this time. Um, it may indeed get darker. And, you know, we shouldn't worry when these things happen because our, our faith is in the Lord. It's not in the world. And, you know, if things get worse in the U.S., I mean, so be it. A lot of Christians today, they're Christians in name only. And when you have all your needs provided by mammon, and mammon in, in the Greek means externalized ego of your wallet. So when 
people are worshiping mammon and what their credit card or debit card can do for them. And we're not relying on the Lord. We can't have a full relationship with him. So ultimately, if we have trade problems, if we can't buy plastic from China and we can't have our needs met on Amazon, I mean, it's not the, it's not the end of the world. You know, we're still going to have a, a great time as Christians. But I, I believe that the brightest days are coming, you know, and, and um, we're seeing that right now and all these amazing things like Radiant Cities, um, Cities of Refuge. The Lord put that on my heart five years ago. It's happening all over the world. I'm on calls like you wouldn't believe of things that are going on. Um, and for my wife and I, the Lord's blessed us. Um, we were homeless and we had no money. And now the Lord's blessed us with a beautiful property in Cincinnati here that the Lord wants to create a, a place of healing for children and a, a small community uh, for people seeking healing. So we'll be growing here and the Lord's bringing resources for that. But that's one of many projects that are happening right now. And, and, and that type of stuff is bringing um, people to the Lord. You know, it's, it's projects that uh, put your faith where your, your, your mouth is. You know, there's a lot of talk and talk is cheap in Christians. You know, we have these phrases, we have these terms, we have intercessors, prophet, all this nonsense, you know, and, we need to get back to that James um, tradition of we, the way we show our love for what the Father's done for others through acts of radical good. It says that in James 2. We need to get back to that and start um, really acting out our faith through works. Now, yes, faith without works is dead. You know, and we don't need to do those works for our salvation, but that's how we show the fruit of what Christ has given to us. So if you're wondering what we can do right now, it's that. And it's leaning on the Lord because, you know, we have to ask the Lord for our purpose that he has for us. We can't build things like cities or rift refuge and these grand Christian communities unless the Lord is behind them. He has to be behind them. But when he is, I believe what we're going to see is we're going to see two systems emerge. We're going to see the system of man and the system of God. And Christians are going to start living in a system of God, which has regenerative agriculture, which has new education systems, new healthcare systems that put God first and not God last. Um, we're going to start seeing these new systems of change. And then the systems of man are really going to look quite ugly and disfigured and useless and broken compared to the systems of God. And we're going to start to see the world shift towards God in his fullness. So, and these times I believe are to come and um, we, we, we can be hopeful and we can, we, can, we can smile when these things happen because we know we have salvation. We know we have the Lord and the best days are yet to come. And I truly believe that, you know, we can, we can espouse hope all we want, but when we truly have the Lord in our hearts, we already have what we've been seeking all along. And, you know, when we, we can't do without bread or we can't do without coffee, so what? You know, we're, we're, we're focused on, on self-crucifixion so we can experience the resurrection. We have to die to self. And in America, my goodness, that, that is so needed, so needed. Uh, so many Christians feel like they are self-empowered to their self, but, but that's, that's the enemy. We have to die to self, and we're going to see more of that, and it's going to be tremendous. Great move of God is happening. Amen. That was well said, and you've hit on a number of points and uh, agree, totally agree. I think when we, when we are put in a situation and we put ourselves in a situation of dying to ourselves and living in God, we're really trusting him, not just with words, but with everyday life. And uh, going to that place can be painful, but really we can have an incredible joy because our relationship is even greater we draw closer to god and we can also even draw closer to others in a in the way of humility so appreciate what you're saying there brother thank you um i saw sharice had her hand up earlier um sharice did you want to i'm still uh, here there's so much you've moved they've moved on i, I felt like oh, i didn't really need to say anything but um I just wanted to, I think Natasha really spoke what she was sharing about the, um, our souls, but then there was a brother that spoke before her that talked about uh, the mandate that God gave at the beginning. Um, and so what was kind of like going around in my head is just this concept. So I've shared this over the last few days. Um, and we're talking about relationship. And we're talking about community. Um, there, there was uh, a book that I uh, was a part of a study that really impacted me, and I've been sharing this word, and it's in scripture, and it's called Hesed, <clears throat> and it just, it talks about that word uh, when you look it up and you really start digging and studying, studying what that word meant and what God's original intent was for the family of God, and there is just, just this deep uh, commitment to one another, and it's beyond duty. 
Um, and, and it's, it's we, we say relational and, and let's be honest, most of the time, the relationships that we hold most dear are the ones that we consider closest to us are our families, the families that we were born into. But that same deep abiding commitment that you have for the family that you were born into as the body of Christ, okay, okay we're born into through the spirit. Um, we have to have that same deep abiding love and commitment for one another. And praise God for the brother that just spoke. Um, when we recognize, when we recognize and see, not according to what we see with our eyes in the natural, but to know that we as a body, when we uh, function and move the way that God uh, originally intended from the beginning, um, and, and not even looking at what's happening in the world system, because yeah, those things are gonna happen, but we live, I think someone else said it on here, we live under a different system. So yes, the world is falling apart and things are happening there, but in the kingdom of God, we won't be affected because we, we have a greater, we have a greater uh, a family and or, or a greater a uh, promise from the Lord concerning us, and so we can rest in that and begin to um, more deeply um, uh, um, support and love one another, uh, so that when these times come. Um, 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 we're not scrambling, trying to figure out what to do. And the thought that came to me as I was listening, the reality is, is that we have everything that we need. That's the reality. The, the, the thing that needs to happen is that we need to be awakened to the fact or as, as the word talks about, our minds need to be renewed uh, um, uh, to uh, God's way of doing things. And the other thing that came to mind as I was listening to everyone, uh, the Holy Spirit reminded me of something that he had taught me or showed me in scripture. We hear so much about, you know, the, the relationship between, because as I'm thinking about this hesed, and, and I was thinking about, I was like, Lord, you know, I just want him to unpack that to me. I really want to understand it. One of the things he brought to mind this morning as I was talking to him, um, and he reminded me of something that he had showed me about Judas about Jesus's relationship with Judas. We always look at that relationship from a negative perspective, but the, you know what was so interesting about that is that Jesus was well aware that Judas was going to betray him. He was well aware, and yet Judas was a part of the 12. And I said to the Lord, I don't know if I could do that. <laughs> I don't know if I have the capacity to walk with someone like that. And, and, you know, we, we teach so much, you know, or if someone's using you or abusing, I'm not saying that, you know, that you shouldn't uh, be careful or be wary and allow the Holy Spirit to, to lead you. But that's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is, is if you think about that relationship, Jesus was so committed to purpose that he didn't even, he wasn't even concerned about the fact that Judas would ultimately betray him. He knew it. And he still walked with him and he still taught him and he still he still attempted to on some level. Um, um, Judas was had access to Jesus to hear his teachings and there was still an opportunity for change. And I was thinking about that, like, wow, Lord, I don't know if I, I have the capacity to, 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 to walk that way. That's an area that you would have to help me in. And so often we, we have Judas's in our lives. <laughs> and and do, do relationally, do we have the capacity to do what Jesus did? And that, I think that's our greatest example. So those are just some of my thoughts. But yeah, this is a great conversation this morning. Hey, thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, look, a lot of what we're talking about here can go against our comfort zones and sensibilities. But we look to the scripture and we see the example of faith. and. Um, it's okay. And actually it can bring us even greater joy when we make ourselves vulnerable uh, to the Lord and available to him to try things that maybe we haven't tried before. Um, and, uh, you know, the, back to this matter of community, um, I, that's why I'm always encouraging people in any kind of community, any kind of Christian community, don't just make it about a Bible study and going home. Um, we're already realizing that was we, when we come together in small groups, we at least should be uh, certainly praying together, and that, that happens more often than not, which is great. 
And then the next thing we think about is let's evangelize together. But I say to you, if we evangelize in word only, and we don't have any kind of solution to the daily life struggles or the economic side of things, what good is that evangelism? We recently did a um, gathering up in North Hartford, which is a poor area of the city of Hartford. And we were working together with the Luis Palau organization, which is a wonderful organization. It's evangelical. It reaches out to people. It shares the gospel. But the pastors all were, and the bishops were saying, you know, we'll do it because it's good to do. Uh, we will do it because, and we've done it before. Everyone in our churches will get saved again. But what people really need are jobs. And why are they saying that? Because in their community, there's been an economic breakdown and there's a great need. So therefore, there's this great opportunity for us at every level, at a church level, at a small group level, at a Bible study level, at a unity amongst these groups level to go beyond. I, I love when we see uh, churches do the um, you bring your car by if you can't afford your mechanical needs. We have people who have those skills who will work in the church parking lot on your car. I think that's awesome because we're introducing another element of living, like we were talking earlier about what if we can't buy a car? Well, if we have the church community together offering its services and abilities to the broader group, and it's not just go at 10 a.m., leave at 11 a.m., maybe I'll have a cup of coffee. That'll be my additional uh, unity in my community is I'll have a cup of coffee and stay for five minutes for a chat. Well, there's so much more of an opportunity uh, in, in these different contexts for us to, to start thinking differently and, do, and step out and do some of these things. Marjorie, you've got your hand up. Love to hear from you. How is the weather in Jamaica? Actually, it's a little breezy. We're having a <laughs> cold front. It's really cold, like high 70s. <laughs> Man, that's close to freezing. Uh, yeah um so we're, we're getting used to your kind of weather as you warm up <laughs> um but i wanted to share um as you you invited persons to share on yes. um provision and uh, the first and i put it in the chat first corinthians 2 um and then you also spoke to making ourselves it's as we make ourselves available um, then God is able to do things in us. And 1 Corinthians 2 speaks about the spirit searching into deeper things and bringing wisdom, unveiling things that are hidden. And um, my recent experience is um, I have terrible insomnia and um, I'm seeing now. As from a, a fall I had a concussion I had in March and I'm seeing a sleep specialist and um, he recommended a CPAP machine which was to help you to sleep and the cost was 1,000 US dollars um, one US um, in Jamaica um, one Jamaican, one US dollar in Jamaican dollar is 153. So it's 153 to one times a thousand. So I'm like, okay, father, Greg says, <laughs> <laughs> and we went into conversation. Jesus and, um, you know, and I've been practicing this thing. And um, it's just like, a friend of mine is relocating, migrating, and he fell ill. And so my husband called to find out how he was doing. And he said, you know, he was doing, you know, but how am I doing? And so my husband shared with him the sleep challenge. And he said, but I have one of those machines. And I was wondering what to do with it because he didn't want to pack it to take it. Not, not, he's not using it. And so that not only did that provide the machine, but it also provided the solution to whether or not I should really go in that direction. Mm. Because a second direction would have been a dental um, solution. 
was not just the provision of the machine, but it also assured me that that was the way to go. Right. So God spoke to you through the circumstance of, Lord, what should I do? This is 153,000 Jamaican dollars, um, which we really can't afford. So what should I do? And he answered by giving you a gift. That's remarkable. So is the machine working for you? I'm going to see the um, doctor tomorrow with it. So it better work. <laughs> <laughs> well, if it doesn't, it doesn't I'm sure God has another <laughs> solution for you. Exactly. Uh, healing exactly. Would be better know, than a machine. I'm, I'm I'll on, tell you that. Yeah. <laughs> so we look to the <laughs> heavenly result as well. But look, that that's the thing. God can do things naturally. God can do things miraculously. Combination of the two. It's all just about seeking his face on it. I love what Maya was saying earlier because I totally agree with it and have spoken similarly about it. Like our healthcare system, um, not only is it all jacked up economically or financially, it's so expensive to do everything and everyone needs insurance this way and that way. But what he said is true. We don't seek God first and then a medical help we seek the way the system works is like, if you have a problem, you just get the medical help, no matter the cost. Um, and so, you know, why, why not go back to where we started? The church, by the way, brought hospitals to bear in our modern culture. The church was the one who developed them to help people. Uh, today, it's very different, uh, but that's how it began. So what if we, as a people of God, sought him first for all of our medical God, uh, needs and, 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 and society witnessed that as a powerful tool? Um, so that's, yeah, that is, that is so true. Uh, we, we, as many of you know, we've been uh, intimate with the whole medical system uh, as my son went through cancer and passed away. And there were some crazy dynamics that went on that were counter to faith. And there was so little faith in the hospital wards these days. It was just, um, it was, it was, it was a terrible, uh, distressing thing. So if we can see that turned around, that would be amazing. And I think that's another opportunity for us. Thank you for sharing. Um, Sharice, go ahead. So I was in the kitchen cutting. I went to go start cutting carrots as I was listening. And the Holy Spirit told me to share about the car. Um, I want to share. I just want to give a little, just as an example of, of how a community and why it came to mind is because there was a young lady that I'm a part of that's a part of this group. And she's having car trouble. And um, one of the things that we wanted to do was to help her as far as with her car. And it was so funny, me being there, I'm sitting there and I'm listening to everything that's happening. And I heard myself as she was speaking, um, she really didn't want to receive the help from those around her. And she was like, you know, I got it. I don't really need help. She felt like that she was a, um, uh, um, I guess, uh, she didn't want to take donations. She just, you know, it, it was just very difficult for her. So I was able to witness to her about uh, just the journey that I walked through. And um, one of the things uh, I, I was, my car was in just, it was falling apart. And I had been needing the car for a number of years. And <clears throat> I just, on a whim, reached out to Greg because, it, you know, Greg, I have a history with Greg as far as like with prayer. Um, my father and I don't have the best relationship and so I couldn't reach out to my dad. And so I was praying. I'm like, Lord, who do I call to talk to? I need a car. I don't know what to do. I don't, you know, I'm a woman. I don't want to be taken advantage of. I don't know anybody in the Connecticut. These are all the things that I was just talking to the Lord about. And so I just happened to reach out to Greg, um, who I have a lot of respect for. We had prayed together. We've done numerous things around New England, specifically around prayer and unity and so I reached out and I'm like, hey, Greg, do you know anywhere to, you know, go get a car? You know, I really need a car. Any, you know anything about like used cars, anywhere you suggest to go? And so um, thus began this conversation. 
I knew Greg had a ministry, but I wasn't familiar like with the whole premise of the ministry. I had kind of like, in all honesty, had read his website in passing, kind of looked over things and not really dug into it or delved into it. And so um, I, as, as a result of that phone call, it led me on this journey um, through the storehouse ministry and through that ministry. And I'm just making a long story short. I'm leaving out a lot of stuff. But through that ministry, the Lord was able. This was just a body of believers coming together that knew that I had a need. I don't even know everyone that donated to the car. Um, I know that. Um, I spent a few days with my husband and I fasting, and that's another story. There's another story behind that. I won't go into all of that, but fasting, there was a, a, a major donation that came in. And outside of that major donation, which was like a $10,000 donation, I don't know really who else gave to the car, but what touched my heart was like all of these people from around Connecticut that I had done ministry with had um, sown into me. And one of the other testimonies was, and I brought up the young lady that I was talking about, because one of the things I had, and I still get emotional about it, um, not realizing that I needed to grow in receiving from others. And I needed to grow in letting others know that I need help. I needed to grow in this thing that we're talking about as far as community and coming together and working together, I was talking about it and I could give, I have no problem giving, but actually being on the receiving end was very difficult for me. And then also my mindset, realizing that I was looking at what was happening from a natural perspective and not according to God's principles. I was so had been so conditioned by growing up in the world system, not realizing that my thinking needed to change about resources. My thinking needed to change about finances. All of this, I, you know, I'm thinking I'm okay. Oh, I'm a leader. I know the word. I did say that. But no, I, there were things in me that the Lord was working on that I needed to humble myself First, I needed to humble myself, admit that I needed help, admit that I needed direction and, and I didn't have all the answers and then begin to seek the Lord about how to proceed and move forward. And then it's an ongoing, and I have to admit, even now it's an ongoing learning, an ongoing, just like I'm talking about this thing, this community thing. I'm thinking I have an understanding of it, but then the Holy Spirit begins to just unpack it even more to me. And I just feel like, the reason for that is because the Lord is asking me to go deeper. And, um, and I think that that's what he's asking all of us on this call is to go deeper. But long story short, I have a new car and it's because the body of Christ came together to help me. And, 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 and now I, I, I feel I'm, I'm, it's, it's, it's overwhelming because, you know, you go through this whole thing like, wow, I can't believe that. But I'm so even much more so, I feel even more so connected because of the things that we walk through together, that connectedness that we're talking about. And I am so much even more so passionate about um, the message of this connectivity um, and, and, and the, the change that needs to happen um, within us individually and corporately as the body, because the world, I think as the brother was talking about, yes, all of that stuff is going to happen in the world system, but we have each other. We have what we need. And so I'm just like on board with this message even more so, uh, just because of even the things that I've learned within the last six months. And I just wanted to share that. Thank you for sharing that, Sharice. And it's like every time God steps in and helps us, it changes us. And, you know, we, when we say we have each other, that there's such value in that if we could only perceive it and tap into it further. Um, there's, there's as much or more uh, in receiving uh, as, as is giving. So both sides of that way of being are so powerful and so influential and can change people uh, instead of just buying and selling, instead of just saying, you know, I just need that money 
to get that thing. I have this need. If I just had that money, I can take care of myself. Um, God just helped me get some money. I think that this this is part of our culture, and we've got to we've got to we've got to change. We've got to we've got to process this. We've got to let's let's start somewhere um, and and move into it. We are uh, coming up here on the top of the hour. Does anybody else like to share a testimony or uh, idea that has come to mind in our discussion today? Um, yes. Yes, Antoinette. Thank you, Greg. Um, so my, my situation is that the Lord um, is just so amazing how he he walks with us individually. And it's in the wisdom of God that uh, once I reach the age of 70, um, the Lord uh, released a gift of art uh, painting and not just painting pictures, but prof a prophetic story of uh, the olive tree. Um, to do with the Jew and Gentile relationship and his, uh, the, the whole history <laughs> um, from the planting of Israel through to the glorious ending of all things. Anyway, so I'm now in a situation um, uh, um, where I've Grant and I, uh, the Lord um, connected us together through the 10 days. Um, and so it's amazing that uh, what I've painted is a representation of his teaching really in, in many different ways. So uh, we've been discussing um, bringing this forward in, uh, in some form to the body and um, um, uh, he has a publisher who's interested in it going to publication and, 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 and. So there is potentially a multiplication of a whole lot of things. But we're in the nitty gritty where the soul, uh, 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 you know, there's the soul issues. There are probably spiritual stronghold issues. <laughs> Um, basically, there's some simple decisions that need to be made and not being able to see long term. Um, it, it's a struggle to make long term decisions. <laughs> I know it's simple, but there we go. Um, at the moment, uh, um, the teaching that you're releasing is really, really, to me, uh, it's absolutely essential that we as a body really uh, understand that God is not asking us, he's commanding us to come out of Babylon. It's not, <laughs> it's not, a, mm, I'll think about it <laughs> when it suits me, maybe. <laughs> Uh, but I, I really think that there is a, a pressing of the Holy Spirit for our good, for our good, of course. Uh, for us to really take up the challenge of what it means to walk by faith and not by sight and trusting in the Lord. So now I've got a practical um, product, as it were, that needs, um, that I want to be a, a kingdom, um, a, new, a new way of doing business. I mean, I've been in marketing. My, my whole career was in marketing. So, you know, we know, we know the background of it. And Natisha given us a, <laughs> a background, uh, an even deeper uh, understanding of how we're all so manipulated. So um, it's, a, it's a tremendous honor and blessing to have um, 
grant on board and wanting to press this forward. However, there's a decision of copyright of the paintings and the story and copy and uh, publishing rights. Um, so the arrangement is, uh, at the moment, it's not agreed, but the suggested arrangement is that I as uh, keep the copyrights of the paintings and the story and release publishing rights, all publishing rights to, um, to reconnecting ministries. So I, had a, I have a problem with that because I kind of had in my mind that um, there are probably people in other nations, small uh, in the body, small groups of people who, who may be interested in publishing a, um, this story in their own kind of context. Um, but if I, if I have given over the publishing rights to one ministry, then um, um, I, I'm not sure if that's wise. So I'm, I'm sort of in between, betwixt and between uh, in my thinking, because I so want to press out a new trusting the law to show uh, to show us how how to bring this work forward because actually it was a gift from the Lord it wasn't something that you know that I thought oh this is a good idea and it was really a gift from the Lord to bring us to this point Yeah. So I'm st I'm stuck. <laughs> right. So you're 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 dealing with some of the uh, details of how you want to move this thing forward, but at the vision level, is yes. not the good gardener not only about the one new man, but it's also about how God uses gardening or the things that we plant and grow and eat uh, as a way of demonstrating His love and relationship part of this whole conversation we're talking about in community. How, how do you see cool. just, um, <clears throat> instead of just going into how do we get out of that um, wrestling match that you're talking about, like give us a little bit more of what the, the heart of God for why you're doing this and how you've been given this inspiration. Okay, the... Um... When, when I got saved, one of the ways in which the Lord uh, dealt with me uh, to bring me out of uh, the, the world and into his kingdom, um, um, through, a, through a series, my, my young son wanted to be baptized, and I didn't know what he was talking about, but to cut a long story short, because of this desire of a six-year-old to be baptized, I landed up going to a church um, who, who said to my husband and I, yes, it's, it's fine to, be, to baptize your son, but you and your wife need to come to church for the next month or so. And then you need to fill in a form and then we will baptize your son. Uh, so to fast forward the story, um, in my having to go to church, uh, I got saved, uh, radically saved at a gospel service one evening. And uh, so I was able to sign the form and <laughs> my, my son got baptized. Anyway, uh, what happened at that point in my life is that the Lord gave me such a powerful a uh, hunger for the word of God that I, um, I, I, I couldn't, I just couldn't put it down. And at the same time in history and on television, this is back in the 1980s, uh, there was a lot of, um, in the news headlines, Israel was always in the news. 
there was a conflict between the Arabs and the Jews and there was war and there was talk of war. And basically, I think every day of the week, Israel was in the news. Now I'm reading the Bible for the first time. I've never, uh, um, well, for the first time with a Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is give, making, making me hungry for the word and giving me grace to drink it. Um, and so I'm reading in the book of Genesis, but I'm seeing on the news the, the, the same place names, you know, the Jews and the Arabs, the Gaza Strip, Hebron, Jerusalem. I'm hearing about the Shekel, and I'm reading it in Genesis. I mean, it was just extraordinary experience. And so the Lord, uh, in the process of time, the Lord just downloaded to me that Israel is the planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor and glory. The Jewish people are a unique people. And, um, and, and, every, and Jesus is Jewish and, and the whole of world history is tied up in this incredible tiny little nation that people are trying to work out. So, um, and everything, so my journey from that point on has been this end time scenario of the Lord uh, the Lord planted Israel to be a nation like no other nation, and how we relate to Israel, we Gentiles from the nation, how we relate to Israel is part of how he's going to deal with us. So, the, so my walk with the Lord has been with Israel and the Jewish identity of the Messiah, um, right, so for the last 40 years, that's my journey. And then here at the end of my, well, I'm not saying the end of my journey, <laughs> but you can, you know, I'm now in my mid seventies. Uh, the Lord suddenly releases this gift to be able to paint prophetic pictures that actually pour that actually are the inside of me. It's actually my, it's my spiritual journey. It's the Lord's story, but yeah. it's my spiritual journey. So it's in the Lord's timing, he's just released this gift. No one more surprised than me, but I just praise God and thank him for it. And then the Lord, Lord connected me with Grant, who who has all of this written material teaching about how important it is for us Gentiles to, uh, yeah, to, to um, not just call Jewish believers as, you know, okay, they're Christians. No, they're not. They are, they are the firstborn. They are, uh, we are the grafted in ones, you know. So, anyway, so it's about the roots and all of that. Yeah, absolutely. So, thanks for sharing a little bit more about the Good Gardener Project. And maybe uh, we should wrap up here today. Uh, maybe if uh, Sharice is available, could Sharice, could you close us in prayer today and pray for Antoinette and Grant in their pursuit of this, uh, getting this out to people? <clears throat> through the book or through the paintings? Cherise, you still there? Yes. Thank I you. am still here. Still here. Would you close? Father, we thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. We thank you so much, Lord. Um, we thank you and we praise you and we honor you and we bless you. Lord, what a privilege to be a child to be a son of the son of God, a son or daughter of yours. What a privilege and honor to be a part of your family. And what a privilege and honor, Father, to be a part of 
what you've planned in the earth, Lord. And I think it's safe to say that each of us on this call, Father, you have our yes. As you lead us forward in the things that you've called us to in the communities that you've placed each of us in, Father, we say yes. We thank you that the eyes of our understanding are open, that our ears, and I don't even mean just to see in the natural, I mean to see what you're doing in the spirit, Father, and that it would really be as your word says on earth as it is in heaven. And Father, that the things that you reveal to us that we would begin and continue to manifest those things in our lives personally, in our communities, in our relationships. Father, we thank you for that. We thank you for this message that you're birthing in the heart of your people. And I thank you, Father God, just for an enlargement, a continued enlargement of territory about this specific concept around community, around resources, around finances, and Father, I thank you even more for the connectivity, specifically um, how you bringing your body together around prayer, but then that specific connection has fostered and nurtured all of these other connections, specifically Grant and, and, um, and Greg and Jonathan and, and just all the other um, um, all the other ministries specifically around New England, throughout the United States. Father, you, it's like you're, thank you, Holy Spirit. You're a master builder. <laughs> you're a master builder. And what you're building, Lord, is beautiful. Father, I thank you for what you're doing in Greg's ministry, in Grant's ministry. Your word says, Lord, that you've given us everything that pertains to life and godliness. So Father, everything that Grant needs to do the work that you've called him to, it's already here. But Father, we're just, we're commanding the manifestation of it. We thank you, Father God, that you lead and guide and direct down a clear path. Thank you for the angels that you give charge over them, Father, to keep them and to uh, guard their way. And Hallie's coming to mind. Father, I pray specifically for her, Father. Uh, I pray for her health, Lord. And I, I thank you, Father God, that you, Father God, would keep her in perfect peace. And when I say that, I'm speaking specifically to her body. I, that perfect peace. Every area of their lives, Father, would be in perfect peace. Uh, so that as Grant advances in the thing that you've called him to, it won't be difficult. He won't have any concerns. He won't be distracted. Father God, I thank you for that this morning. And thank you specifically for what we talked about as far as the ministry. Father, Lord, thank you that you your voice is clear. We hear your voice. Your word says, my sheep know my voice. And the direction to go in is clear. There's no confusion. There's no doubt. There's simply rest in you. And Father, as you unfold your plan, Father, that we'll see and we'll move as you, as you direct. And I thank you, Holy Spirit. The spirit of wisdom, the spirit of knowledge, and the spirit of revelation be released into this specific ministry, into this specific circumstances. I pray that also for Greg as well. And anyone else that's on the call, just Father, just the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of knowledge and understanding, the spirit of revelation, that Father, we begin to move in you. And thank you, Holy Spirit. And we continue, Father, to move as one, to move as one. And as we move as one, we'll see your kingdom and your kingdom expand. And more importantly, your glory. Ha! Ah, that you would be glorified in all the earth that the nations would hear of you and want to know who you are, Father. We thank you for your church. We thank you. We give you glory for her in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, and Lord, I pray that Antoinette and Grant can work through these matters, that your prophetic paintings will go forth and people will be touched grown and increased in jesus name bring joy and peace through that situation hallelujah and amen amen good thank you be, yes good to be with you all good be great discussion today and uh thank you thank you for participating sharing and uh being the body together
in Jesus' name. Hey, Greg. Yes, Nancy Ann. When are we going to make this three hours? <laughs> Not Seriously. today. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank Keep God it in mind, God. please. <laughs> Thank you, Brother Greg. Hey, good to hear from you. I have to listen to you. I was in between two calls. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs>